Hopefully it's recording now. Excellent. All right, so welcome to, I think this is 21 minus 499. All right, so this is Research Carnegie Mellon, and I'm going to give a couple of introductory lectures on various topics. So the first one I want to talk about is Cookie Monster meets the Fibonacci numbers. So this is going to be Zeckendorf decompositions. Has everybody seen the Fibonacci numbers? Okay, excellent. So this is a nice one to start with research because the most important part of research is actually what question to ask. There are a lot of things where once you ask the right question, the way to attack it or the proof is almost intuitive because of your training. But the hard part is coming up with what is an interesting question to begin the day. A lot of it is trying to find the right perspective. Uh, in the interest of dealing with going to this class here and then going to Baltimore for the joint meetings of the math societies, I tried to limit the stuff I have in my backpack. How many people here have never seen a standard Rubik's Cube? Okay, good. So I only brought two specialty Rubik's Cubes. So for instance, this cube looks a little bit strange. And so it's got this, the right colors, but it's got some kind of strange pattern. And it's actually two by three on these sides and a strange nine on this side. And this is another one that's similar with a kind of cross pattern. And if you try to solve red, it doesn't turn the right way. Now you can turn things in this plane, but you can't turn things up like you could on a normal cube. This is actually almost the same as a normal cube. If you turn it at 45 degrees and consider this your first face, and now you move things up like that. Similarly, for this one, you have to hold it at a like a 30 or 60 degree angle, and you move it like that. It's the power of the right perspective. It's not quite the same, because you could have pieces that are flipped, and that can cause some issues. You could have centers that are rotated. And on a regular cube, you're not going to notice a center that's rotated, because the pictures aren't the same. Whereas here, this center is not a square. It's a rectangle. So there will be some differences. But most of it can be solved the same as a regular cube. It's the power of looking at things the right way. So Joshua and I solved a, a nice problem a couple of years ago, but we were not looking at it the right way. And yeah, that's yeah okay, right. he'll agree with me, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then it took us a couple of years, and when we were working with other people, we said, oh, because we were trying to generalize it. If we look at it this way, then all of a sudden we can prove what we did and a lot more with a lot less work. And sometimes if you know too much, you're going to look at something and try to use the special properties of numbers or the special property of whatever system you're looking at. So I can't emphasize enough how important that is. Utilize what tools you have. What do you know? Well, if you've only taken linear algebra and discrete math, that's probably where you're going to be drawing a lot of your inspiration. The more math you see, the more opportunities you have to make connections. I've written papers in marketing because my wife is a marketing professor. And when I was dating her, some of her professors were, wait, you're dating a math guy? Can we talk to him? Now, they're smart people in the subject. If they could have solved the problem using their techniques, they would have. They were stuck. Their techniques didn't work. Well, I have a different set of tools. I have a different set of tricks. Feynman talks about this, if you've ever read some of his stories, where he would be given integrals to solve that nobody else could get around. He goes, well, they probably tried all the standard stuff, because if the standard stuff worked, they wouldn't come to me. Let me jump to differentiating under the integral sign, which most people don't know. And then he would solve it very quickly. So to me, the phrase is the law of the hammer. If all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. One way to look at this is if you're good at something, find a way to use it. An even better way to look at this is if you're good at something, go to the land of the screwdriver with your hammer. If they could have solved it with a screwdriver, they would have. You have a different tool, use that tool. And then the last is you know, just some advice on success. Control what you can. If you get an email, respond to the email within 24 hours. Write up ref your work as you're going along so that when the semester is over, or the summer is over, you've already got stuff there. Whatever you can do, these small little things, do them. So it's not a coincidence that I chose those letters. You, you get REU for REUs, the research experience for undergraduates. And so if, though, if any of you are interested in, in programs like that, the deadlines are fast approaching and I'm happy to talk to you. These are terrific opportunities to work over the summer and just spend a little bit more time exploring mathematics. All right, so this is joint with many students and colleagues over the years. All right, so uh, I'm going to skip over some of the slides because we've got a lot to do. Uh, 
a lot of it is ask interesting questions. I've talked about the law of the hammer. I've talked about writing things up, so I'm gonna skip all this. You know, prereqs. How many people have not seen any probability? Okay, great. So I'll go this really fast. So x is a random variable with density p of x. It's non-negative, it integrates to one. The probability I take on a value between a and b is just the area under the curve. If you took a calculus class and they never mentioned probability when they taught you integration, it's probably a little bit extreme to say the professor should be shot or the teacher should be shot, but not by much. I, only once in my life has someone come up to me on the street and asked me to calculate an area for them. And this was in Berkeley, California. You read some interesting characters there. Probabilities, you do that all the time. And this is one of the reasons we care so much about integration. And we care so much about certain classes of functions which are easy to work with. Uh, the next is the mean is the average value, so it's x times p of x. The variance or how spread out something is x minus mu squared p of x. So the smaller this is, that means the more concentrated you are about the mean. One of the most common distributions is the Gaussian. Hopefully everyone has seen the Gaussian. Bell curve, standard normal. When you have this many names, it's probably important. All right. N factorial is the number of ways to order n objects where order matters. N choose k, lots of different ways of writing it, is the number of ways to choose k objects from n when order matters. If I'm lecturing and there's something you haven't seen before, you have two options. Either raise your hand or speak up and say, Professor Miller, could you say a little bit more about that? Or just go, yeah, I can quickly learn that tonight or over the next week. And just nod your head and look like, oh, yeah. And then the last one, which is useful, is Stirling's formula. I used to do this all, well, no, no, this is being recorded. I will stop. Uh, Stirling's formula, n factorial, is approximately n to the n e to the minus n squared of 2 pi n. And this gives you a good sense of how quickly n factorial is growing. There's a lot of fun games you can play as to how can you get this elementarily. I'm not really going to go into that too much. All right. There are a lot of ways to write the Fibonacci numbers. You probably see them going 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, or maybe 1, 1, 2, 3. I'm doing it 1, 2, 3. And the reason I'm doing this is Zeckendorf's theorem. Every positive integer can be written uniquely as a sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci numbers. And now you can see why I'm defining my Fibonacci's like this. Otherwise, I lose uniqueness if I have two ones, and it's even worse if I have a zero. There's a lot of ways to prove this. The standard proof is the greedy algorithm. So you know, it's not going to be a random example because I've constructed the slides, but let's take 51. So the greedy algorithm says, at every point in time, do what's locally best. So I throw away the largest Fibonacci number less than or equal to 51, which will be 34. And so I take 34, and it's now 34 plus 17. Largest Fibonacci less than or equal to 17, 13. And I just keep going like this, and I have my decomposition. And if I ever could have thrown away two Fibonacci's that were adjacent, then I'm an idiot because I could have thrown away the sum, which would have been the next one. And so with a little bit of work, you can make this rigorous. If you want a homework assignment, that's a good homework assignment. Make it rigorous and show that it will give you a decomposition. And then show if you have two different decompositions where each Fibonacci number is used at most once and you never have adjacent, that they are distinct numbers. Now, most of you are interested in theory. There is a practical application of this theorem. It is one of the most absurd applications of pure mathematics. How many of you are not native to the United States of America? So keep your hands up. Do you think in kilometers? OK. You know how many kilometers 51 miles would be? Not 70, 70 is way too low. Uh, 80 miles. A little bit more than 80. How do you convert from miles to kilometers? Approximately times 1.6. Approximately times 1.6. Let's take the Zeckendorf decomposition. Let's shift each index in the decomposition forward by 1 and add. And you get 83. 51 miles is 82.1 kilometers. One way to convert from miles to kilometers is to write the Zeckendorf decomposition and shift the indices. The reason this is true is the golden mean and the conversion factor for miles to kilometers are almost the same. And so this is a very interesting way to convert. It is, of course, absurd to convert like this. You should just multiply by the correct conversion factor, but it's an interesting result. Now, if your number is small, like, like maybe 7, you're going to have a little bit more of an error because the growth rate of the golden mean hasn't really kicked in yet. 
So what you would do is you would take seven, and instead of consider 700, convert 700 and then divide by 100, and then it would do much better. All right, so I want to start talking about some theorems. I'm not going to go through all the different theorems we can. I think I'll just do this theorem. So as n goes to infinity, the distribution of the number of summons in second of decompositions converges to a normal. Now this is a great theorem for a variety of reasons. One of them is, how do you count things? What do you want to look at? I want to make sure I'm comparing apples and apples. I want to have things on the, a reasonable scale. If you have a number of size 10 to the 100, and you have a number of size 10 to the billion, which do you think is going to have more summons? The number around 10 to the 100, or the number around 10 to the billion? Gen yeah, generically, the number around 10 to the billion will have more summons in its second of decomposition. I could, of course, cherry pick the number but a generic number will have more summons. So in order to be fair, I look at all numbers between the nth and n plus first Fibonacci, because all of them will have to start off with Fn in their second of decomposition. So I'm basically playing a fair game. All the numbers under consideration are being drawn from the same set of possible summons. And here is a plot, and you can see that the plot does look approximately Gaussian. So I presented this years ago at a conference, and I said that my students will be proving this in about a month, so please nobody at the conference prove this. And the real question will be how far will the students be able to push this? So I want to talk a little bit about how you might prove this. Um, the other stuff here is you can also look at the distribution of gaps between summons. You can look at the length of the longest gap between summons. There's all these different questions. I'm not going to go into this now. There's you know, way, way, way too much mathematics to go into while we stay conscious. But um, I will just mention for the distribution of the longest gap, you actually have a nice double exponential coming in naturally. The only other time you might have seen this in math is a cookbook problem in calculus where they just want to play with you and make sure you can differentiate like chain rule inside chain rule. But stuff like this does come up and leads to some incredible strong concentration results. All right. So the proof is very combinatorial. So before my students and I started looking at these problems, people used the theory of continued fractions and other tools like that to attack the problem. As a number theorist, I'm supposed to be excited about this, but I'm not. It's not the right way to look at the problem. You should look at the problem combinatorially. And when you look at it combinatorially, the proof of Zeckendorf's theorem is a lot more work. Much more work than the greedy algorithm. But you get so much from it. So here's one of my favorite theorems. If you have C identical cookies among P distinct people, the number of ways you can divide this is C plus P minus 1 choose P minus 1. It's often called the stars and bars problem. So we are assuming the cookies are identical, and we are assuming the people are distinct. Sadly, if you are, say, an engineering graduate student, the faculty advisor may not consider the graduate students unique. They may not be distinguishable in the eyes of the professor. You know, this is student 1, this is student 2, this is student 3. They're all working on this project for me. I do not want to have that kind of environment in this class. So here is a combinatorial proof. So consider C plus P minus 1 cookies on a line. If you've never seen Sesame Street, there's a wonderful character named Cookie Monster who classically loves cookies. In the modern era of political correctness, he now says cookies are sometimes food, but we will assume that we have the original Cookie Monster who is always willing to eat cookies for us. So imagine Cookie Monster eats P minus 1 cookies. How many ways can you choose P minus 1 from C plus P minus 1? Well, that's just the definition of the binomial coefficient. And it turns out that that's going to break the cookies into P sets. And it's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with how you choose these cookies to eat and how you divide. And so explicitly, let's say we have eight cookies and five people. So we have to add on an extra four cookies. Cookie monster shows up. Cookie monster eats cookies. He eats the second, the third, sixth, and ninth or whatever that one was. So everything up to the first eating cookie goes to the first person. Two cookies for the first person. No cookies for the second, two for the third, three for the fourth, and one for the fifth. And there's now a one-to-one -one correspondence between the number of ways I can choose p minus 1 from c plus p minus 1 and the number of ways I can divide c cookies among p people. This is essentially all of combinatorics. Whatever problem you're given, we cast it as something else that you can come and solve, and say, aha, now I know the solution to the original problem. The difficulty is finding what you can recast it to. 
formally, what we've solved is we've solved the equation x1 plus dot 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 plus xp equals c, where the xi is an integer greater than or equal to zero. I'm about to do a little algebra on the board. Whenever you're hearing a talk, you should never try to follow the algebra line by line. You should go big picture. Could I understand this if I needed to? We can modify this and adjust it. Well, if I wanted to have the, you know, I didn't like the fact that somebody got no cookies. Maybe I want to make sure everybody gets at least one cookie. Well, that would be the same as forcing each x to be at least one. So I could write each one of them as maybe one plus y1, one plus y2, one plus y3. And then I would just decrease c by p cookies, which I've already assigned. And so if you put in lower bounds, it's actually very easy to incorporate them. Upper bounds, we can't incorporate easily. You have to use inclusion exclusion. So let's let p and k be the number of integers in our interval from fn to fn plus 1, whose second of decomposition has exactly k summons. So the largest summoned is fn. We have a bunch of other ones, and we can't have two adjacent summons. So what we're going to do is we're going to label our indices i1, i2, all the way up to ik. And we know that the gaps between any two indices has to be at least two. And i1 has to be at least one. And so if I let d1 be i1 minus one and dj be ij minus ij minus one minus two, I'm basically just subtracting off what I know each one of them has to be at a minimum. And this is essentially the excess. And then if I look at the sum of these, when you do the algebra, the sum of the d's is n minus 2k plus 1. That's the cookie problem. So we now get that the number of integers in fn, fn plus 1 with exactly k summons is just n minus k choose k minus 1. We have a closed form solution. If we generalize beyond the Fibonacci numbers to more general recurrence relations, we no longer have a closed form solution, and the math becomes much worse. This is what I mean about being misled. When you look at this, you might think, ah, this is how you prove it in general. Oh, no. Uh, the original paper was 50 pages, and the journal made us reduce it to under 20 pages. I would not want to read. Oh, so I would love to read that paper in the journal. We have the archive version where the full details are posted. And it's a lot of lemmas to handle the general case. And then with some Carnegie Mellon students, I finally completed the chain of ideas to make the proof a lot more elementary. But when you don't have this explicit closed form expression, you have to go through generating functions and a lot more work. So I'm going to give you a quick proof of how you can use that to prove Gaussian behavior. So I mentioned that I presented this at a conference, and I said, I know my students will be able to solve it. Just give them a month, and then we'll see how far they can go. This was the original proof. So they used Stirling's formula, they used the binomial coefficient, and they just expanded. So it turns out it's a little bit easier to look at the interval um, fn plus 1 to, I think, fn plus 2. So this is now going to be how many things. It just makes some of the k minus 1s become k's. This is how many numbers we have between fn plus 1 and fn plus 2. It's going to just be fn plus 2 minus fn plus 1, which is fn. So this is going to be the probability of having exactly k summons. We expand out the binomial coefficient. And now we just start doing algebra. We use Binet's formula to write the nth Fibonacci number in a nice form. Uh, we're going to ignore the lower order terms because they're really lower order. And you just go through, you keep doing algebra, and you do some more algebra, and you do some more algebra, and you do some more algebra. You mutter some things about your professor, but he can't hear you. You continue to do the algebra. You continue to do the algebra. And finally, you get to the little red square, which means you've reached the end of the proof, and you're done. It's not illuminating. You don't really have a sense of why it's true. It's, I've done some algebra and I have the result. That's great, that's the first thing you want is, do I have the result? But now that I have the result, do I have some idea of why it's true? So I'll give you a quick sketch as to why it's true. So you can consider more general linear recurrence, and it's a big question as to which coefficients can you put in. We'll assume the c's are all non-negative integers. c1 has to be positive or things become far more interesting. And if people want, there's a lot of really nice stuff to look at if you allow C1 to be 0. Uh, CL has to be positive, because otherwise you wouldn't write it if it was 0. And so it turns out you still have Zeckendorf's name. There's a unique decomposition. There's a generalization of what it means to be a legal decomposition. It's not worth going into that now. And then you also have the Gaussian behavior. Uh, things become a little bit more involved in terms of doing the computations. Uh, things are more involved. And I'm going to give you a quick sketch of the proof as to why things are Gaussian. 
I, what is your favorite base to work with? Okay, I wasn't sure if I would get 10 or 2 at Carnegie Mellon. I will risk the following joke. Does anybody know why the computer scientists confused Halloween with Christmas? Do you know the joke? What's the reason? Uh, like 25 being uh, base 8 is... Yes, oct, th oct, oct 31. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oct 31, oct 31 oct. equals deck 25. And this is why the computer scientist confuses Christmas and Halloween. We are basically doing something almost in base Fibonacci. Well, let's go back to base 10. We know base 10. Let's try to build intuition there. If you take exams, frequently exams give you a problem. And what you should do, especially in the Putnam, is try a simpler case first, build intuition. Let's build intuition on base 10. So we're going to say HN plus 1 is 10 HN. It's just the decimal decomposition. And so now a legal decomposition just means I have a sum where the AIs are between 0 and 9. And the only constraint is that the, the leading digit can't be a 0. And if I want to know how many summits I have, I just sum up all the AIs. Well, all the AIs are uniform, identically distributed random variables from 0 to 9, except for the last one, which is just from 1 to 9. Well, as my number becomes very, very large, the fact that one digit can't have a 0 is not a big deal. And if you've seen the central limit theorem, if you have a sum of independent, identically distributed random variables, it's going to converge to a Gaussian. And that gives you a sense of why you might have a Gaussian in greater generality. There's a lot more stuff you can do. Um, I am not going to go through these slides in any great detail at all. But if I just go like this, then you can at least pause the video, although the slides will also be online. skip all the stuff about gaps, but there's a lot of questions you can do. Uh, we looked at Fibonacci's. I will skip all that. Uh, that's my daughter. We actually made a Fibonacci spiral out of fuse beads. And then here was an interesting one. And there's a lot of great work you can do on this problem. So we're trying to come up with new decomposition rules and eventually trying to find things that are multidimensional. This one can be reduced to one dimensional. The stuff that Joshua was doing with me is multidimensional. So we take, a, we take the Fibonacci spiral. You can either see it here or better here. So the Fibonacci numbers cover the plane as you spiral out with a square that's you know, Fn by Fn. And so this is just compressing things so I can draw it a little bit easier. And the rule is when you take your summons, you can't take two summons that share a wall. So I've got one, two, three, four, five. I, I can get six with four plus two. So I don't need to add six. I can't get seven because four and three they touch, or four, one, and two they touch. So I have to add seven. I can get eight. I can't get nine. Can I get 10? Nine and one. Nine and one. Can I get 11? Nine, nine and two. You know, since the next number is 12, I almost surely can get 11. Um, but how did you say I got 11? 9 and 2, 4, or, 4 and 7. So 9 and 2, or 4 and 7. So what this tells you now is you've lost unique decomposition. And then you can start to ask, how often can you represent numbers? And there's a lot of great things you can do. Uh, set up a multi-recurrence relation. And we were able to show that it's approximately 92% of numbers um, where the greedy algorithm will decompose in a legal decomposition. I, I don't think I included it here. Um, but the number of decompositions is that, okay, it's over here. The number of decompositions is growing exponentially. So if there was a unique decomposition, it would be basically one. And it's like 1.05459 approximately to the end. So it's exponentially growing on average how many decompositions you have. So there's a lot of stuff you can do here. All right, for the last part of this talk, I want to go back and, you know, this is my daughter a couple of years ago. I'm her father. I love her. But that doesn't mean I want her to beat me. And so I try to find ways to make math into games. And last year, I gave one of my thesis students the following. Here's a game I've created involving Fibonacci numbers. Your thesis is to tell me how to beat my daughter. And she was able to prove something about the game. Now, this game actually began 
with a student at Carnegie Mellon from the class many years ago. And you know, Kristen Flint and I were able to do some things, and then my student pushed it a little further. So how many of you have ever taken a class on games? Okay, so I'm going to show you some fun stuff. So we know the Fibonacci numbers, we know Zeckendorf's theorem. Um, so I'm not going to go through this part because you've seen this before. Okay, uh, there's a lot of stuff about you know, the Zeckendorf's theorem about summoned minimality. You know, if you looked at other ways to decompose things with Fibonacci numbers, it turns out nothing will do it with fewer summons than Zeckendorf. All right, so I'm not going to bother proving that. So here's the rules. It's a two-player game. You alternate. Whoever moved last wins. Okay? And what we're going to do is we have a bunch of bins. We start with n pieces in F1, and the others are empty. And a turn is if you have two pieces on Fk, you can basically put one piece at fk plus one and one at fk minus two. And if you have two things in adjacent bins, then you can combine them and push them down one more. So we're basically allowing ourselves to use the rules of Fibonacci numbers. You know, fn plus fn plus one is fn plus two. That takes two beads and pushes it down. Or if I have two beads on fn, it's the same as fn plus one plus fn minus two or something like that. And you keep playing until there are no more moves left. And the question is, who has the winning strategy, and does it depend on how many things you start with? Now, there are a lot of games which are really interesting in terms of choosing winning strategies. Let me see if I can jump to the right spot. Oh, I don't, okay, I don't think I have it. Um, oh, give me a second. No. All right, so I guess... I got I didn't include that slide. Huh? Not a big deal. All right, so does the game end, or could this game go on forever? For each end, who has the winning strategy? And then the last one, which is the important question to some extent, is who has the winning strategy? Imagine you are a political consultant hired for somebody who's planning on running for president in 2020. I say, great news! There's a way for you to get 270 electoral votes and win the presidency. Wonderful, what should I do? Oh, well, it's an existence proof. <laughs> You're not going to make many friends with an existence proof there. They were like, well, could you give me something a little bit more constructive as to how I can get to 270 electoral votes? So let's say we start off with 10 pieces at F1. So we start off with the number 10. Well, there's only one possible first move. We have to take two things on one and put something on two. Now we have two possible moves. We can take a 1 and a 2 and make a 3, or we can take two things on a 1 and put it on a 2. So let's say we'll take two things on a 1 and put it on a 2. Note that 8 times 1 plus 1 times 2 is still 10. 6 times 1 plus 2 times 2 is still 10. We have three moves now. I can split the 2. I can take two 1s and make a 2, or I can take a 1 and a 2 and make a 3. This time, let me split the 2s. Uh, for the next move, I'm going to take two ones and move to a two. That's the only move I can do. And I keep playing like this. And when the game ends, no moves left. Player one was triumphant. And so here I've listed all the moves. Now you all have terrific powers of observation. What do you find interesting about this slide? So I've listed all the moves in the game I just showed you. Something should look interesting. Yes? So there's going to be one uh, in each bin, and there's not going to be uh, two bins that are not empty that are next to each other. When, when the game ends? Yeah. yeah so, it, so it turns out that this is not just a fluke. You will always end in the second of decomposition. And the game will always terminate and will always terminate in the second of decomposition. Yes? I think the, uh, the sum of squares is constantly increasing. Ah! Uh, except for the first step, where when we move from one to two. So there's something called a monovariant. It's a quantity that always moves in at most one direction. And in fact, something like that is crucial in the proofs. But you're, you're all making great comments, but you're overanalyzing. When you look at this chart, something should strike your Something looks a little, should look a little strange. Just 
physically looking at this picture. Why is there a gap? Yeah, why is there a gap? Because over here, when it was this person's turn, they combined the one and the two and made a three and put the zero here and moved that down to one and moved that one to here. They could have split the two and added one extra move. And by adding that, we'll still get to the same, but it will change the parity. So one way to figure out who's going to win are these parity moves. Can you do something to get to the same spot but change? So there's a lot of analysis on winning strategies. What my student was able to prove is all games end in finally many moves. I'll skip the proof. She got an upper bound. She has some stuff on the fastest game. Some nice plots on the frequency of how many moves. So we played, what we played, what if it's a random game? Where whenever you have moves available, you randomly choose. So a lot of these things I think would be almost impossible to prove, but I think are interesting. Here's the interesting thing. Player two has a winning strategy as long as n is not two. But unfortunately, it's non-constructive. So this is where the slides were that I was trying to find. I'm going to highlight this with a simpler game. It's a dot game. So you have a rectangular grid of dots, and whoever goes last loses. And on your turn, you choose a dot, and you eat all the dots from there up and there to the right. And it turns out, player one always has a winning strategy. How many of you have seen this game? Okay, so this is a phenomenal game. No matter what size the board is, except for what? One by one. Yeah, one by one board, player one is screwed. So as long as you're not on a one by one board, player one has a winning strategy. Here is the proof. If player one has a winning strategy, play it. Okay, so we've handled that case. If player one doesn't have a winning strategy, since it's a finite board, who must have the winning strategy? Player two. So let's assume we're in the case where player two has a winning strategy. All right, player one chooses the upper right corner. You are player two. What should you do? You can give me just a general statement of what you should do if you don't know which specific dot to choose. Which dot should you choose? Play you play your winning strategy. All right. I will say that this was the dot that was your winning strategy. Okay? By assumption, player two has the winning strategy in this case. So if player one goes here, player two has a winning strategy. Let's say it goes here. You, I think you just realized it. So what should player one have done? Play where player two would Yeah, player one should have just gone there to begin with. And player one can switch parities and now essentially become player two. This proves player one has the winning strategy. And it is a non-constructive existence proof. All right. Step one is to prove the result. That's nice. We have the proof. And so what she was able to do is we have a notation that describes games. And we'll color it. Uh, it's closer to red on my screen. It's closer to pink on the projection. We'll color it pink if player one has the winning strategy. We keep going down. And all of these are still going to be colored pink. Because if we assume player one has the winning strategy, the only move is to go here. So they must still have the winning strategy. Player two can go either here or here. No matter where player two goes, player one still has the winning strategy. So let's say player one goes over here. And we can keep going. Um, and eventually, we see that, OK, so it was player one's turn, player two, player one, player two. Player one is going here, and they still have the winning strategy. But we could get over here where player two is going, and it's the same configuration. We have n minus one ones, and we have one five. We had one extra move. So if this is truly a winning strategy for player one, if we assume that this is still a winning strategy for player one, then if we get to this one, player two has the winning strategy. And then we can start pulling things backwards and upwards and just eventually see that if you keep assuming player one has a winning strategy, if you just go through all the cases, player two can steal. But we don't know if you're supposed to steal or not. So one possibility is to try to investigate generalizations of this game. A lot of it's going to be very hard. The low-hanging fruit is gone. But there's some good stuff in this. Uh, Joshua wrote a paper which is very accessible in terms of looking at a two-dimensional generalization of the Fibonacci numbers and trying to come up with these decomposition results. We were able to prove 
the limiting behavior in a very special case, I would love to do the more general case. And so that's going to be a really good combinatorial problem. That's like wh where we kind of hit a lot of roadblocks with the combinatorics. It's yeah. so ugly. We're thinking there must be another way to attack the problem. Right. And so we, we solved the original problem elementarily, but the elementary approach did not generalize to the higher dimensional analogs. We can handle the higher dimensional analogs, but only under an assumption which makes the combinatorics nice. We would like to consider the more general ways of trying to combine things. And a lot of these, they're meant to just be springboard problems. I am not wedded to any of these investigations. In some of the other projects, I am. You know, when we get to the more something differences, which we'll do next, there is something that I want done because no one has studied it yet. And so we got to look at it. But for this, these are springboards. So if anything here excites you, go with that. All right. Any questions about this before we hit stop for the first project? All right. Do you want to carefully hit the circle in the center to stop the recording?